thanks to the Center for Ideas for having me here, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Several years ago, the art critic James Elkins put ads in newspapers and magazines asking people to send him stories about paintings that made them cry. He put together these stories in this wonderful book, Pictures and Tears. Now, some of the stories were about the sorts of things that, well, made sense. They were, they were based on paintings that depicted the sort of thing that if you saw them in the real world, might make you cry. The ravages of war, the suffering of children, um, the blinding of Samson. Some of the stories had a personal resonance. An English professor wrote to Elkins describing a painting that his wife did of their bed, unmade. And um, soon after she finished the painting, she left him for another man. And one day he was alone in the house, and he looked at the painting and started to cry. Other paintings were more mysterious in the responses uh, that they gave. These are giant purplish-black canvases by Mark Rothko. They were on display in a canvas in Houston, Texas. And uh, Elkins got the most letters about these. Uh, people would sit on those benches, they would look at the paintings, and they would weep. Uh, part of this probably had to do with the fact that they, know, they knew that Rothko killed himself soon after completing the paintings, and that gave him a certain meaning. So art can move us in sort of surprising and often like painful ways. And it's not just visual arts. Uh, sad songs, we, that might make us cry, but we also love them. And then there's stories. So the great philosopher David Hume took this great puzzle. Why, why are we drawn to these things, these artworks that make us suffer? And he, and he asked a question focusing on the case of stories. So he wrote, it seems an unaccountable pleasure which the spectators of a well-written tragedy receive from sorrow, terror, anxiety, and other passions that are in themselves disagreeable and uneasy. And you're thinking of things like Macbeth. Or to take it more contemporary, there's a TV show called This Is Us. Um, I've never seen it myself, but my friends have seen it, and I'm told you see it and you just cry. Um, and apparently there's an internet article reassuring you that it's actually okay if you watch these, this show and then you weep. And this is what, what you know, Hume called the paradox of tragedy. Why do we enjoy things that give us this degree of pain? Next to that, you have what's sometimes called the paradox of horror. Why are we drawn to stories, to, to movies, to, to TV episodes, of things that, that, that shock us, that horrify us, that sometimes gross us out, like, um, like Psycho. And you can say Psycho, well, Psycho has all sorts of other artistic merits. But then there's like torture porn, immensely popular movies that, that exhibit the, the degradation and torture and horrors that could be done from one person to another, yet they're immensely popular too. And what go, what's going on with that? Um, Jonathan Gottschall, the literary scholar, notes that this appetite for the horrible isn't just present um, in adults. So he describes the children, the, sorry, the stories that children create, and he lists a few of them, told by preschoolers, trains running over puppies and kittens, a naughty girl being sent to jail, a baby bunny playing with fire and burning down his house, a little boy slaughtering his whole family with a bow and arrows, and so on. Or consider our imaginations and where they go to. So a wonderful study by uh, Killingworth and Gilbert used uh, an iPhone app. And the app would go off randomly for the volunteers of the study. And when it goes off, you had to answer two questions. The first question is, are you focusing on what you should be focusing on, what's happening? Are you daydreaming? Are you mind wandering? And the second question is, suppose you're mind wandering. Is it positive or negative? Are you thinking of good stuff? fantasies, happy memories, or bad stuff. Memories of when you embarrassed yourself, dreads, fears. He found two things. They found that first time, um, a majority of the time when people are supposed to be doing something, their minds are elsewhere. I'll leave it as a question, how many of you are here, what? You know? <laughs> um, and then second, their minds are often somewhere bad. Our, when we have full reign on what to think about, we often think about the negative. So how do we make sense of this? Well, when Hume phrased this puzzle, the puzzle which we're going to solve today, I hope, he phrased it in a particular focus. He talked about tragedy. This will happen for fictions, for, our, for stories. 
And um, Samuel Johnson, in, the, in his uh, uh, masterful biography of William Shakespeare, zoomed in and said, it only works for stories. So he wrote, the delight of tragedy proceeds from our consciousness of fiction. If we thought murders and treasons real, they would please us no more. I think this is pretty plainly wrong. Um, I, uh, uh, there are many uh, now renditions of the O.J. Simpson story, uh, documentaries, reenactments, and some of us here are old enough to have experienced uh, the, the murders in his murder trial um, by watching it on TV. The fact that it was real takes away nothing from the pleasure we get from it. In fact, some would argue it enhances it. Some would say that when you see something on TV and it says, ripped from the headlines based on a true story, that makes us more interested, not less. And this is an old insight. Plato tells the story of Leontius. He saw some corpses lying at the executioner's feet. He had an appetite to look at them, but at the same time he was disgusted and turned away. Finally, overpowered by the appetite, he pushed his eyes wide open and rushed towards the corpses, saying, look for yourselves, you evil wretches. Take your fill of the beautiful sight. And any one of us driving down a road and seeing an accident knows the experience of slowing down a car to take a look. Here's my own story. I'm driving to work um, on Whitney Boulevard, driving to my office at Yale University, and I catch a glimpse of that, and I actually stop the car to take a closer look, because it said, gruesome details. <laughs> and don't we all want to know the gruesome details? Then there's cases where we seek out suffering, and it's not the imagination at all, it's real life. Um, the appetite many of us have for hot foods, or spicy curries, or wasabi, um, the joy we take in roller coaster rides. The, the psychologist Paul Rosen and his colleagues did a survey, and he found that, that there's always a sizable minority of people who like different versions of burning, or disgust, or fear, or pain. And, um, and there's almost nobody, nobody he finds, actually, who have, has no masochistic pleasures. We all like some kinds of pain in the right doses. Um, this shows up in the sexual realm. Again, a, a sizable number of people, at least when it comes to fiction, novels and, uh, and movies, find an immense satisfaction in, in the experience of, of uh, S&M, or BDSM. And, um, and there's actually some data on this. The, the, the major porn sites have done us the favor of releasing their data publicly, telling us what people like to search for and who likes to search for what. It turns out that, I'm sure none of you have ever logged onto a porn site, but if you were to, um, Google Analytics keeps records. Basically, they can figure out based on your prior searches who you are, whether you're male or female, gay or straight, roughly how old you are. And then there's some various surprises. One surprise is that women are far more likely to search for terms, uh, for porn terms depicting a violence or degradation. Words like humiliation, extreme suffering, pain. Um, and, um, and this seems to reflect a more general attitude. When it comes to actual masochistic behavior, um, it's hard to get good data on this and to use survey data. And the survey data tends to be unreliable because you might ask the wrong group of people. But I'll take this as suggestive. Um, this was from OKCupid, a dating site, and they asked the percentage of people who, quote unquote, like it rough. And 75% of men said yes, and 62% of women said yes. That's really, th that stuff is really interesting. So what's going on here? I think there's some low level explanations which are right. So psychologists have often pointed out that pleasure isn't a thing in and of itself. It rather depends on contrast, on what you've been feeling before. And so one answer for why we may like a hot bath or spicy food is because when the sensation of pain is over, it makes the subsequent sensation all the more pleasurable. It's like the old joke about the guy banging his head against the wall. He's asked, why are you doing that? He says, it feels so good when I stop. And this might capture some of it. Another mechanism is signaling. You might, uh, you might engage in certain uh, so-called masochistic pleasures to show everybody how, how tough they are. And I mean, this is more of a male than female thing. It's more of a teenage thing. But, um, but you know, if you find a group of people stuffing jalapeno peppers in their nose, that's probably why they're doing it. Probably not alone. They're probably with friends. <laughs> then then there, there's the role of suffering in bringing groups together. And, 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 and this shows up maybe most strikingly in religion. So in the Philippines, um, people have themselves crucified. 
in, in, in honor of the sacrifice of Christ. In Mauritius, uh, worshipers will have skewers put through their face and hooks attached to their body, and then they'll drag heavy objects up a distant hill um, while experiencing great agony. Now, I'm, probably none of you do something like that, but the major religions, um, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, have, Hinduism, have some ingredients like this, some degrees of suffering and sacrifice that's part and parcel of the religion. And one dominant theory of this comes from Durkheim, the great sociologist who points out that when groups suffer together, it brings them together, it brings them closer and, and enhances their loyalty. And um, uh, Dimitri Exgalatas Exgal um, and his colleagues have done work showing that, that these people who suffer go through these extreme rituals in Mauritius. In the course of their suffering, it makes them feel more fondly to the group. They donate more money to the group in a later, uh, in a later psychological test. Um, high ordeal participants, those who suffer more, give more than low ordeal participants, and so do people who watch them. The more pain, the more donation. And finally, it shows up in secular ways as well. So, um, so some clubs for Brazilian jiu-jitsu, for instance, um, celebrate the promotion of somebody to a higher belt by a belt whipping ceremony where they're whipped by fellow members. And they know what they're doing. This makes you feel more close, more tight to the group. It has, in this case, pain serves a social goal. I don't doubt any of this, and I'm gonna assume a lot of it's true in what follows. But what I wanna say now, and I wanna devote the rest of the talk to, is the claim that the proper understanding of masochistic pleasures in general, of suffering of the story I've been talking about, actually has a deeper explanation. And it actually tells us some, I think, foundational facts about human nature three foundational facts in particular. One is negative emotions aren't necessarily unpleasant. So um, this is, goes back to Hume. So Hume described it as, a, talked about sorrow, terror, anxiety, and other passions are in themselves disagreeable and uneasy. But I don't quite think that that's true. I think that, uh, that a theory closer to that of Lisa Feldman Barrett, a constructivist theory where our emotions can be what we make them to be, can be modified and, and reconstrued is closer to the truth. Even the most fundamental emotions, the so-called basic emotions of, uh, of anger, fear, disgust, surprise, happiness, and sadness are not good and bad in and of themselves, but rather can, can be positive or negative depending on the circumstance. So you take somebody who is being attacked by a tiger and they're very afraid and this, they would say, is an awful experience. But what I want to suggest is it's not the fear itself that makes it an awful experience. The fear is related to, some, to, to danger, but it's the danger that makes it awful. It's the idea you could get killed or mauled. That's what makes it awful. But if you could have the fear and take away the actual danger, suppose you're doing it through virtual reality or something, then it'd be kind of pleasant. And people like this kind of thing. They, do, they go to haunted houses. They like being afraid in the right measure. They like being angry. Anger is typically a response to injustice, and injustice is a bad thing. So anger is typically in response to a bad thing. But if the injustice is fictional or imaginary, or if your anger makes you feel like you're a better person, then it could be quite a positive experience. Sadness is usually kind of bad, but who among us doesn't enjoy a good sulk? Or, you know, take the feeling, take it broader, take the feeling at the end of a marathon where your heart is pounding out of your chest, you're soaked with sweat, you're, 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 you're lightheaded. Now, if as you're sitting here, these feelings came across you, you would feel like you're gonna die and it'd be like the worst moment of your life. But if you do it at the end of a marathon where it's wrapped up with accomplishment and hard work and, and success, then it could be blissful. You could savor the memory of this suffering for the rest of your life. The moral here is that of Shakespeare. There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Now, negative emotions aren't necessarily unpleasant. We can construe them in different ways, but I don't want to overstate it. We have limits to how much we can do this. Um, sometimes it's re they really intrinsically are unpleasant. So one example is disgust and nausea. It's very hard to, to make nausea transcend nausea and make it a good experience. And in fact, nausea is one thing that people never seek out. 
Or I'll take another example. This is from uh, uh, Daniel Bergner's wonderful uh, series, of collection of articles about perverse sexuality. He describes a, 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 a female masochist who would engage in the most uh, uh, brutal masochistic uh, interactions with her boyfriend. But she hated to go to the dentist. She said, it's too painful. And, and he said, why don't we treat this as a great sexual adventure where you, know, you, you get this great masochistic. And she says, it's the dentist. I can't, you know, I can't see it that way. And, and I think that in some way, when, you're, when your suffering is not chosen but involuntary, um, it's very hard to transcend it. You take the most hardened masochist, the most powerful, toughest person in the world, and they wake up one morning and they stub their toe. No one's going to like that. That's just pain without choice, and it's hard to construe it. The second fact about human nature I want to suggest is that we aren't hedonists. The perception of human motivation where we seek out pleasure is itself fundamentally flawed. We sometimes seek out the unpleasant, in fact. And, um, and so I would disagree with Hume on this point, too, where he says it's unaccountable pleasure that we like tragedies, which depict sadness. And in some way, he's right as a puzzle. But it's not special to tragedy, and it's actually kind of how we work in general. The economist George Lowenstein um, talked about uh, endurance mountain climbers, people who climb snowy peaks around the world. And he went over the diaries of all hundreds of people describing these events. And without exception, they described these events as terrible. Uh, constant blinding headaches, agonizing frostbite, crippling boredom. Um, you might think that, it, that the social cohesion of being with other people um, helps you. But in fact, either due to the oxygen loss or something, you can't really talk to them. And in the end, most of the time, people end up hating the people they're going with. Um, once he summarizes the experience as harshly uncomfortable, miserable, and exhausting, yet people love it and devote their lives to it. Now, some of you in this room may do endurance sports of that nature, but, um, but most don't. But there's something else which I think more of you do, which is have children. Now, <laughs> these, these are my sons. I haven't told them I used them in the slide for this purpose. Um, but, but the experience of having kids, as psychologists have long known, it's complicated. Uh, Jennifer Sr. describes it as all joy and no fun. And what she means by this is people who have kids will often say, they're the greatest things in my life. They give my life meaning. But day to day, it kind of sucks. And we know this from the sort of beeper studies. So you, you give people a beeper that randomly goes off. And then you ask them, when it goes off, you say, what are you doing? And how much are you liking it? How much pleasure is it giving you? And consistently, the finding is that when people are with their kids, particularly their young kids, they say, this is awful. I'd, I'd rather be doing the damn dishes. And, and, um, or take marital satisfaction. This is a summary of four studies. Um, it kind of speaks for itself. You start off, you're very happy if you're married, you have kids. It drops, 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 drops. And then something glorious happens. Your kids leave the house. Um, <laughs> You know, and so, so Dan Gilbert um, summarizes the data by saying, the only known symptom of empty nest syndrome is increased smiling. <laughs> or take joining ISIS. Why would somebody join an apocalyptic death cult? Um, and a little while ago, the writer Joyce Carol Oates tweeted, all we hear about ISIS is puritanical and punitive. Is there nothing celebratory and joyous? Or is query naive? Now, this was Twitter, and Twitter's not the most sympathetic audience. You got a lot of heat for this. But some people defended her and said, you know, whatever you think of ISIS, and you think very little of them, there's something about this which appeals. And I think this idea was nicely summed up. Actually, somebody who knew about this was Hitler. And George Orwell summarizes Hitler's views and the insight that Hitler had. Hitler knows that human beings don't only want contact, safety, short working hours, hygiene. They also want struggle and self-sacrifice. Oops. Whereas socialism and capitalism have said to people, I offer you a good time, Hitler has said to them, I offer you struggle, danger, and death. And as a result, a whole nation flings itself at his feet. You see this even in the most modern Western pacifistic societies. There's this appetite for more a rebellion against comfort and safety 
a desire to have deeper meaning, deeper struggle, a desire for a clash between good and evil. Typically what we do in, this, in these societies is we satisfy them through our imagination. We don't actually fight evil. We watch over and over and over again movies which show other people fighting evil. Um, or even better, we simulate it with battle simulations, which are immensely popular, particularly for young people. And they're popular because they scratch an itch that, for better or worse, modern life doesn't sacrifice, doesn't, doesn't scratch. We're not hedonists. What we pursue often requires pain and suffering. What we want, by its very nature, demands some degree of struggle and pain. And I'll give you some examples of the sorts of things we want. One of the things that drives us is what I've been calling hard play. And this is the human desire for play. And in cases like play fighting, and evolutionary biologists have wondered for a long time, why would people play fight? Why would children and, other, and other, the young of other species play fight? Um, but the answer is pretty clear, and there's a lot of evidence for it. The answer is fighting is important for, for adults to know. Um, and you know, for, for human adults, often fighting includes sort of verbal battles of different sorts, but we'll, we'll focus on the physical fighting. It's useful to know, and you get better at it the more you fight, but you can't go up to people and fight them to get better at it because you could get killed, you could get them killed, you get injured, you get maimed. So evolution has thought up this extraordinarily neat trick, which is you take the people you or your friends, your family, you love most in the world, and you fight with them, but you hold back in such a way that you practice the fighting and get better and better at it. And just about every phenomenon of play you could think of is best seen as this form of safe practice. Now, this is a physical form of safe practice, but we do it in our imaginations. We're drawn to seek out worst case scenarios. When we have a chance to imagine whatever we could imagine, we could focus on tremendous victories, satisfying our goals, being loved, being respected. But instead, we often think, what would happen if my partner left me? What would happen if I ran out of money? What happened if I left? We think about worst cases. And I think there's a logic to this. Because we think about those cases because that's what we need to know in order, that's what we need to practice on. You know, it's very well and good for me to imagine winning a big prize, but the truth is, if I won a big prize, I would know what to do. I say, thank you, that's great. So instead, what I need to think about is, what am I going to do if my university fires me? What am I going to do if my best friend betrays me? Because that's, those are harder problems. I think this could partially explain the pleasure we get from horror. I think Stephen King was right when he said, we make up imaginary horrors to help us deal with real ones. And, um, and now, horror movies tell fantastical stories. Um, we, we, zombie films and zombie TV series are a popular venue. And this is not because we need to prepare for the zombie apocalypse. But it does, it, instead, what zombie movies are always about and this is nicely summed up here with fight the dead, fear the living. Zombie movies and zombie TV shows are about what happens when the world goes to hell. When the police are no longer there, when society falls apart, where will you be? And that's the sort of thing we're interested in. And we watch these movies because however unpleasant, however terrible they are, they capture our interest. A second thing that pulls us is difficulty. We like difficult things. Um, uh, this is sometimes called the effort paradox. It's a paradox because typically when I'm trying to, to I go from one place to another, I pick up some food or do something, we try to do what's easiest. But sometimes we seek out difficulty in and of itself. And there's different flavors of it. So one phenomena psychologists have found over and over again is if you create something with difficulty, it's hard for you to do it. You'll like it more than if it was easy. So in one classic study, um, they gave people instructions on how to build something, a little thing out of, out of wood and glue. And then they asked them, now that you built it, you could keep it, how much money would I have to pay you for you to give it up? Another group were just given the thing, which was actually much better than they could make themselves. It turns out people wanted a lot more money to, uh, to give up something they had built themselves. We tend to imbue our own effortful creations with value, something that uh, the investigators call the Ikea effect. <laughs> we also like effort 
that doesn't give rise to a product. So the joy of solving a crossword puzzle isn't necessarily getting it, of doing a crossword, isn't necessarily solving it, getting it done. It's struggling with it. We enjoy the struggle. And the great psychologist, uh, Mike Csikszentmihalyi, has pointed out that, that a, a fortunate few in the world devote their lives to the pursuit of what he calls flow, where you get totally immersed in a difficult project. This is not pleasure in any simple sense. It's difficulty, it's struggle, it comes with anxiety, but it's immensely rewarding. A third force that motivates us is morality. We are moral creatures from the get-go. Um, my day job is as a developmental psychologist, and I've studied the emergence of moral understanding and moral motivations in, in, in babies and young children. And one thing we know is that very early on, um, they are, they, they, at least for those individuals they know, they are very predisposed to make things better, to help. There are several studies, for instance, where an adult appears to be in, fakes being in distress, and then, um, and then we see what the kid does, and kids will inevitably help the adults, soothe them. Um, a lovely set of studies by uh, uh, Felix Varnikin and Michael Tomasello show kids an adult who's in some sort of trouble. And then they see, will the kid, without any prompting, rescue the adult? So I'll show you a clip from one of their studies. Oh. Um, oops. Now this is the sort of positive side of morality. You might think of when I said morality, helping and being kind. But there's another side of morality, which is our punitive natures. And to introduce this, I want to tell you a story. Um, this guy in London had a cat. And a cat, every day, would go out. But every night, it would come back home. And everything was great for the guy. Until one night, the cat didn't come back. And didn't come back. So, I sad, but the next morning he goes out and he's going to throw out uh, his garbage and he opens up the garbage bin and there's the cat inside the bin. So he says, how did the cat get inside the bin? Now it turns out that there's cameras everywhere in London. So he got access to the tape from the camera pointing at in front of his house and he saw this. Now, he then put the video on Facebook and said, does anybody know who this woman is? And it went viral, and sooner or later, they caught up to her. And, uh, and, and um, now, but that's not, I don't want to talk about why she did what she did, because I don't understand that. But, <laughs> but, um, but here's what's interesting. It's pretty clear why this was upsetting to the guy. It's pretty clear why this was upsetting to the cat. But, the response was outrage. And she had to actually come under police protection due to death threats by people who wanted her dead. And this is something else about morality, which is we have an appetite to make bad people suffer. We have an appetite for vengeance, for retaliation, when it happened to ourselves, but also for what psychologists call third-party punishment, where we want to take somebody who did something wrong and make them pay. You see this in all sorts of ways. Um, uh, two of my colleagues uh, at Yale, uh, Arbor Tassimi and Karen Wynn, did a study uh, with toddlers uh, who couldn't speak, too young to even speak, uh, to see whether, what their attitude was towards wrongdoers. And they used a simple method. Um, it turns out that if you offer a kid um, one cracker versus two crackers, they'll choose two crackers, because they like crackers. That's not the interesting finding. But it turns out, but you can also show kids a good guy, a, a puppet who does nice things, and a bad guy, a puppet who hits people and does bad things. And then you can ask the question, what do kids do when a nice guy offers one and the mean guy offers two? And what they find is they overwhelmingly choose the one. They give up the extra cracker as a way to shun the mean guy. Now, I've got to be realistic here. 
they're, they're, they're moral creatures, but they aren't saints. Uh, and so here, uh, the results shift. Um, it's been argued by evolutionary theorists that our desires for punishment and spite um, fuel cooperation, actually. We couldn't be moral creatures if we didn't have some way of taking goodness and making it adaptive. If, if at any point you could have a bad person could get around doing whatever he or she wants without retaliation, goodness could never evolve. Our desire to make bad people suffer is part and parcel of the evolution of morality in general. But it reflects our appetites. We have this appetite to see bad guys get what they deserve. Um, and this is not just located in movies. Two books that, that claim to capture most of English language literature are called comeuppance and revenge tragedy, because these things are so common in the literary world. That's one aspect of why we like what we like. Another aspect is we're very drawn to the evil characters. Now, maybe we're drawn to the evil characters because without the evil characters, you can't get the moral, moralistic tale going. Maybe we're drawn to them in part because of wish fulfillment, where uh, we want to be these evil characters to some extent. And we don't want to be this way in real life, but we will do this uh, in fiction. And any, in any case, it's, it's long been observed that the most interesting character in uh, Milton's Paradise Lost is Satan. Um, the Joker is far more interesting than Batman. And the most interesting character from uh, Silence of the Lambs is, of course, Hannibal Lecter. If we like difficulty and we like morality, you could add these together and you get the fascinating drive for difficult morality. And this could explain a sort of puzzle. Some of you may remember the ice bucket challenge where people poured ice water over their heads to, uh, to raise money to combat ALS. And you might ask, why precisely did people do this? Why did they want to suffer as part of a tragedy? And as to, to gain money, uh, to, to, why did they want to suffer to gain money uh, to do something moral? And, but the answer is this, more, this is a general fact about how people work. There's a lot of evidence for the martyrdom effect, where if you suffer and you experience pain, it infuses you with more moral energy. You are much more likely to raise money to cure cancer by having um, a, a marathon than by having a, a, a massage session, session where everybody gets a back rub and now this gains money. That doesn't even make any sense. You have to suffer. <laughs> um, the flip side of this is if you don't suffer, your morality is devalued. And this is called tainted altruism. So the story of tainted altruism is you take two people one of them raises an enormous amount of money for charity. The other one raises very little. You might think the person who raises the most money for charity is a better person, but it's not as simple as that. It depends, did they like it? If they did like it, you devalue their contribution. Um, the, the, the researchers on the study gave the very real case of Daniel Pallotta. Daniel Pallotta ran a business where he, um, he would raise money for different charities, including charities revolving AIDS and leukemia and so on. And, uh, and he raised millions of dollars for these charities. Until one day, a newspaper reported, you know, this isn't, his business itself wasn't charitable. He's making some money off of this. And then nobody wanted to work with him anymore. Even though he's making the world a better place, if you make the world a better place, you cannot be having fun. You cannot, and other studies, the study done here, uh, talked about people, did an experiment where they told people about people who worked in a homeless shelter. If you work in a homeless shelter and you hate it and it's difficult, you're a good guy. If you work in a homeless shelter, you make just as much difference, but you're actually having the time of your life. You're meeting people, you're talking to people. Then people say, what are you doing? That's awful. So, talked about hard play, difficulty, morality and difficult morality. And I would argue that one of the ways to understand why we pursue suffering is suffering emerges from the pursuit of these desires. It reflects the choice to have a meaningful life. But what about unchosen suffering? What about cases where you suffer, you experience pain, but you didn't choose it? It's not part of some sort of more general pursuit. Um, what about when you get assaulted 
if your child dies, um, you lose your business, something happens. How do we make sense of that? Well, there's some evidence that we reverse engineer it. That is, once we take the suffering experience, we try to tell a story where it makes sense, where it happened for a reason. My favorite example of this was uh, that of James Costello. Um, there was a terrorist attack at the Boston Marathon several years ago, and he was caught up in it. He was seriously burned and injured in other ways, and had a stint of several months in a hospital in Boston, where he met a nurse, they fell in love, and they eventually got married. And the day of their marriage, Costello wrote, on Facebook, I now realize why I was involved in the tragedy. It was to meet my best friend and the love of my life. As the expression goes, everything happens for a reason. Um, in collaboration with Kony Banerjee, who is my student at Yale University, we found that young children very strongly believe everything happens for a reason. When you tell them a story about something bad happening, they will favor explanations where this bad makes sense. It's punishment for something. It's part of a larger plan to teach you a lesson. But you might wonder, what about adults? I mean, the problem is that everything happens for a reason. It sort of a, a, makes sense in a world which is ruled by gods. It makes sense in a world which is pervaded by intentional design. But what about science? And what do you do when you also have a scientific conception? And many people argue these cannot sit side by side. Religion and science are fundamentally opposed. My favorite depiction of the opposition between us is summed up in this Onion headline, um, which, <laughs> so, so Coney and I were interested in whether this depiction of the conflict is accurate. So we did another study where we asked people to describe a deeply significant part of their life, event in their life. It could be something uh, valuable and good like uh, uh, getting married or the birth of a child. It could be something tragic and terrible, like the sudden death of a loved one or a debilitating illness. And then we asked them a bunch of questions. Was it caused by fate? Was it meant to be? Did it happen for a reason? Did it happen to send a message? And we tested both theists and atheists. And what we found was this. And there's two findings here. One finding here which interests us is that even hardcore atheists who explicitly denied the existence of God often said things happen for a reason. They even said something happened to send me a message, which doesn't seem like a trick of language or a banal claim, but a real substantive belief. But the second fact, as you can see it here, is the people who are religious believe this much more. And religion in general provides a framework for suffering. Every theologian, every theological framework, every religious uh, uh, culture has explained suffering as in some way the will of God part of the divine plan. The most extreme example of this is uh, from William H. Atkinson, um, who was the first president of the American Dental Association and a very devout Christian. And, um, and he was president at a time when anesthesia, like ether, was becoming more popular and, and was becoming popular and starting to be used. And like many people at the time, he thought this was terrible. He wrote, I wish there were no such thing as anesthesia. I do not think men should be prevented from passing through what God intended them to endure. <laughs> and you might laugh at this, but I have heard friends tell me, honestly, that this is just nonsense, but it's true for natural childbirth. That there's a sense in which that, that does make sense, and your mileage may vary. But the idea of suffering having an essential purpose does resonate. This is a, there's a series of postcards, um, popular in England, that depict a sort of rosy world, of, uh, rosy view of the world. And for many people, uh, they see psychological motivation like this. They see us as fundamentally hedonists seeking out a good time. I hope I've convinced you that that can't explain a lot of what we do. It can't explain painful religious rituals. It can't explain our appetite for occasional, for violent or rough sex the love we have for horror movies, for difficult and painful endurance pursuits, and even for viol violent apocalyptic groups. Or even something as simple as pouring ice over our heads for a good cause. I've said we aren't hedonists, but it's more complicated than that. Because we all, I think, have these other more substantive goals, 
But people vary. We also want pleasure. And, and I think people vary between the balance of how much we want pleasure and how much we want suffering. The title of this talk is The Pleasure of Suffering. Half of you are here for the pleasure, the other half for the suffering. Um, I made it this far into my talk I'm about to end, and half of you probably think this has been a real pleasure, and the other half said, oh, I got my suffering in. Um, and you can tell, you can ask questions about making that choice. Who makes the choice and what the consequences are? So I'll give you th three examples of this. Um, one is, uh, look at the jobs, the jobs people do. Um, there was a study of two million people who, um, and, who, and broken up into 500 jobs that these people did, the most common jobs. And they asked people, and, and here are the most common jobs. They asked people what jobs they found most meaningful. And I'll tell you, these aren't the most common, the apologies. These are the most meaningful. And here's the top of the list. Clergy, military, social workers, and teachers. Now these jobs have interesting properties. They don't pay well. They aren't particularly strongly respected. And they're tough. They're tough. They are not conducive to happiness and pleasure in a the, in the normal sense. But they do provide extraordinary amounts of meaning. There's only one job that is both very meaningful, people, the people doing it are very meaningful, and it pays extremely well and that's surgeons. You could also ask uh, a question about what countries have people who claim to live meaningful lives versus happy lives. And um, this is the, the title of this paper gives away the answer. So here are the top nine happiest countries. When you ask people how happy are you, these are the top nine countries. They are are, as you could tell, they are affluent democracies with, uh, with strong social support uh, and, and some degree of a regulated free market. They're nice places to live. I will tell you because of where I am, number 10, hey. Um, <laughs> but now let's ask a different question. The World Value Survey that did the happiness data also asked people, do you feel your life has an important purpose or meaning? And here are the top 10 countries for that. And they are, for the most part, poor countries, very poor countries. Why would the countries which have poverty, extreme poverty, also have the citizens that say they have the most meaning? Well, there's different answers. One answer is these countries have, are more religious, and religion is correlated with seeking meaning. But another answer, I think, is that if you're in an, there's so much good about being in an affluent society, but you're liberated from the need to do difficult and demanding work to survive. Life is less of a struggle. And that's mostly good. But if you're in a society where life is a struggle, where, life, where, 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 where there are demands upon you that, that force you to do difficult things, that has the benefit of giving your life more meaning. Finally, we would ask about people. Um, this was a study by Roy Baumeister, Kathleen Voss, and colleagues. And what they did was they asked people, Two big questions. To what extent do you agree with the phrase, sentence, I consider myself happy? You could do this, oh, by the way. Um, and to what extent do you agree with the sentence, I consider my life to be meaningful? Then, weeks later, they asked a whole bunch of other questions. And they want to see the relationship between being happy and other things and being meaningful and other things. So here's their data. Here's what they found. For both people who said their lives are happy and people who said their lives are meaningful, they had rich social connections, they weren't alone, and they described themselves as being interested and engaged, they weren't bored. This is what they had in common. One thing they didn't have in common is this. People who describe themselves as very happy are healthy and they tend to be rich. Money is correlated with happiness and so is health. Not so for meaning. If, once, if I know you have a very meaningful life, it tells me nothing about how healthy you are or how much money you make. And then there's this. Happy people describe easy lives with little worry and little stress. People who say their lives are meaningful describe their lives as difficult with more worry and more stress. And I'll add a final thing. They had a final survey question that is very simple. I'll tell you exactly what it is. They didn't elaborate. Are you a giver or are you a taker? People who describe themselves as very happy describe themselves as takers, very meaningful as givers. 
There's a Connecticut artist who took a lot of these postcards and he gave them different titles. Um, and for this one, he took the postcard and he gave it a title from uh, Aldous Huxley's dystopian novel, Brave New World. So Brave New World is about a world in the future where everybody is happy. But they are happy due to behavioral control and pharmaceutical drugs. They are basically sort of living happy but meaningless lives. And Brave New World tells the story of many people, including the story of John, who's described as a savage. And John rebels against this world, goes off into hiding, doesn't want to live this sort of artificially happy life. And there's a wonderful scene in the book where a representative of the establishment finds John and approaches him and, um, and says, uh, you, you have to come back. And they're arguing back and forth. And, says, and he says, we can offer you uh, comfort. And John's reply is this, but I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. I want freedom. I want goodness. I want sin. I think there's no better summary of human nature. And I'll stop with that.